uh, Dr. Weiss, and he's going to talk to us about the Jewish medical ethics. And I just would say that um, actually his wife and my daughter have been very close friends uh, for many, many years. They went to high school together. And um, I'm hoping that uh, his wife, Mia, will convince my daughter to make Aliyah as well, too. I think and they're, uh, they're, working they're on having it. the talk. They're, they're talking the talk. the talk. Okay, great. So uh, I really want to thank everyone for, uh, well, I want to thank Shmuel for inviting me to, to make this talk because you always say things like, oh, I, you know, I have all this knowledge, I want to give it over, I want to share it with people, and, um, and you never really get that opportunity, so uh, wish me luck. <laughs> anyway, um, so just to give you a little bit of um, background, uh, you're going to follow me around with that the whole time? Um, so today we're going to talk about just an intro about you know why why we're here. Uh, what we're going to talk about is uh, a little bit of history about medical ethics, um, some biblical references, uh, and um, some Jewish medical ethics, some case studies, and question and answer. If you have any questions at any time during the presentation, I would like to make this interactive. Uh, don't want to have to wait for the uh, the uh, answers or the questions to come at the end because some of this stuff is going to be new to you. And it's going to be interesting, at least I find it interesting. Um, and I think that what Shmuel really wanted to discuss, and my, my thoughts were, was that he wanted to bring home why we're studying all this stuff and how to bring it into the day-to-day -day life. And, uh, and so just to give you a, a little knowledge about who I am, um, I, uh, I'm a physician, I'm an OBGYN. I was in medical school in Ohio State, went to Einstein residency. Um, worked as an OBGYN, that means delivering babies, in, uh, in, uh, in West Hempstead, Long Island, but I was born and raised in Muncie, and um, moved to Israel about five years ago, took a hiatus, so to speak, while I was getting my license, continued to practice medicine here in Israel, um, but at the same time I started my own, like everyone does in Israel, startup country, a startup nation. Uh, started my own biotech company and then went into work with uh, Teva Pharmaceuticals, uh, which is what I'm doing as, as well. And, and so the question was raised by Shmuel, how does, how does the Torah intersect with your everyday life? So I'm going to present to you a little sliver, a little sliver of what it means to be an OBGYN, not necessarily the pharma, that's, a, that's an entirely different set of ethics. Um, but really medical ethics and understanding what medical ethics is, understanding what Jewish medical ethics are, and then applying it to how, how to you, you see it from a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so that's kind of the idea. And to get started, you really need to understand the historical perspective um, and then translating that into the biblical perspective and then uh, everyday daily life. So. I really want to thank uh, Rabbi Dr. Eddie Reichman. You know, and anyway, so he's a musmach at, uh, at YU. He's an oh. ER physician, uh, but he's, his, his pet projects now are, are uh, medical ethics. So this particular lecture, I heard, I heard live from him and I heard it on tape, and, uh, and you can get a lot of medical ethics if you're interested in medicine, if you're interested in sciences, and you want to learn more about the, the, the different things that we touch on today, um, YU, uh, org has a, has a site where you could actually have, a, have an app that you could click on as well. So a lot of uh, Hakar Satov goes out to, to Eddie, uh, Dr. Reichman. He's actually Rabbi Dr. Reichman. And he's an ER physician at Maimonides. So I came into, into contact with him when I was a resident. Anyway, okay. So that's basically it in a nutshell. So let's start at the very, very beginning. Um, law started when um, the first documented laws we have that we have hi historical note of um, actually were found in, in Bavel, in Iran, Iraq area, and um, they're way back in the, uh, it's called the Hammurabi Code. You may, not, you may or may not know what the Hammurabi Code is, uh, but in fact, a few months ago or a year ago, not too far from here, they found another stone that had all these laws written on it um, in Tel Hazor that were similar to the laws that they found written uh, on the Hammurabi Code. And it talked about business, how to deal in business, how to write contracts, um, and it also touched on how to pay surgeons. Um, and the medical portion of it was an eye for an eye. If you injured someone and they lost an eye, then you'd have to give up an eye. 
Um, and there was a lot of different um, issues in this Hammurabi code. Uh, and here's a, a, a slight picture of it, that this was the stone slab that they found. Uh, there were 44 columns like this with 28 paragraphs and 282 laws. And that was, uh, I think, 1700 BCE. Um, and from those laws, they talked about interaction in business, interaction in regular law, and eventually it came down that medical ethics were, uh, were came out of that, how to treat, um, how to treat people. And, um, and back then they didn't have much to treat with. They had basically uh, maggots and different things to blood let, um, and then you'd pay to get your blood let. It's well known that um, Hippo the Hippocratic Oath, Hippocrates, was, the, was the historically the, the, the first one who came out with what we call Western medical ethics. Um, and he gave the guidelines uh, of the duty of physicians how to treat patients. And that was about 500 BCE. And um, actually, the Rambam, who you have some svarim here, I'm sure you have Mishnah Torah, uh, he wrote a parish on Hippocrates. Um, and the Rambam, as you may or may not know, was also a doctor, and he practiced medicine, and he practiced uh, medical ethics as well. And his comments on, on, uh, on Hippocrates were really the, the first known um, ethics, so to speak, uh, that we start to see and understand how he bridges that gap between um, Western medicine and halakhic medicine. Uh, and does anyone know when, when uh, the Rambam lived? He lived about 1,200. He was born Erev Pesach, and came out on Shabbos in the year 1137. When? 1137. So about the 12th century. So from 500 BC to the 12th century, very little, very little happened. 1,700 years, very little happened in, in, in modern medicine. Um, but that's not where we first learn of genetics. Does anyone have an idea where genetics are, are shown in the Torah? By Yaakov with the sheep. Excellent. Excellent. I was debating whether to add that. Um, but there, there's a little bit of controversy whether or not you, that's true, but that's an excellent point. Anyone else have anything else? Where? Kava. How? Rib from a guy who made something else out of it. I like cloning. Yeah. Good, so good. Cloning with that Good point. Okay, but that's not what I was talking about. Um, so, Vela told us Yitzchak and Avram, Avram holy to Yitzchak. So, why does it say um, Avram holy to Yitzchak? Because if you look, I guess I'll read it up here. It, it, Rashi says that the that Yitzchak and Avram, Yitzchak the fish ahayu the tzani ador omrim me avimelech is Avram Sarah. That when actually Sarah was post menopause, they don't know what menopause is when women can't have babies anymore, and, um, and she can't conceive, and she was been with Avraham her whole life and never had a baby and was infertile, uh, which means you can't have babies, and all of a sudden she gets taken prisoner by Abimelech, and the next year she has a baby. So the whole world says it wasn't Avraham's baby, it was, it was Abimelech's baby. So what, what, what did Hashem do? So Hashem did because all the 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 Litzani Ador said that it was up from Avimelech. So what Ma'as said to Rish Baruch Hu, Sark Klos Ter Kanov Shal Yitzchak Dom La Avraham. Avraham and Yitzchak were carbon copies. The Rabbi Sachs, um, Lord Emanuel Sachs, was the uh, Jonathan Sachs, Emanuel Jacobowitz. Uh, Jonathan Sachs wrote a wrote an essay about this was actually that Yitzchak was actually a clone of uh, of Avraham, and in fact they looked exactly alike, and, and illness and he wasn't old until Avraham prayed to become old. Um, he, he prayed to become old in such a way that people were looking at Avraham and thought it was Yitzchak, looking at Yitzchak thought it was Avraham. They couldn't tell the difference. Avraham prayed for Zikna and he became old and was um, was uh, was granted to become looking old so they knew who Avram was and who Yitzchak was. In fact, Morris says that, that people didn't get sick until Yaakov. Used to be, there's a um, Yalka Shimoni that says that people would sneeze and die. And that was it. 
And so Yaakov prayed to get sick so that people could pray to Hashem and, um, uh, and then that they would have something to pray for. So shortly thereafter, if you look, when Rivka becomes pregnant, she becomes pregnant with the open question, twins, right? So, so when, when uh, Yaakov was going to make the break to be born first, the measure says that Esav grabbed his heel, right? And that's why it's called Akev. So, Yaakov. So the question is, and as an obstetrician, and one of the things that always bothered me was how could, how could he have grabbed his uh, heel? If anybody knows about births, a baby gets born, it's in an amniotic sac, the sac it sits in. And in twins, it's usually in two amniotic sacs, correct? Okay. Sometimes if they're identical, they can still be in two sacs. Sometimes if they're what we call monozygotic, monoamniotic, they're in one amniotic sac. And, and then they could be, uh, it's a very, very complicated um, twins and they usually uh, miscarry very early in pregnancy. So there's an article written uh, called uh, Biblical Twins that discusses all the twins in the, in, the, in the Chumash. It's actually a very interesting read and tries to tie in what happened um, in, in these cases. And so one of the ones that are very interesting are, are Yaakov and Esau. Uh, if you look, if, how could they be identical twins? Right? What, is the, what does the Torah tell us about them? One looked, Esau looked, Red, and hairy. big and hairy. And <laughs> Yaakov looked very slight and light and, and like whitish, right? So, so one of the theories that they put forth was that they indeed were in one sack. And not only were they in one sack, but they had something called a twin-twin transfusion. Now this is when we go off the uh, plantation a little bit from what you guys are expected to know. But, um, but this is the article, and you can see they even put up the, the uh, specific... Um, family tree of all the twins and what we're talking about here. And this is actually in what we call the Green Journal. The Green Journal is the OBGYN t uh, journal um, that's from the American College of OBGYN, and this was in 1998. Here we, we have a picture of twins. Um, you let me know if I have to zoom over <laughs> anything, but, uh, and you can see here, they're in one sack. And if you see here, this is their blood flow. This is called the umbilical cord, and it goes to placenta. In identical twins, there's one placenta. And in one placenta, you could have these blood vessels that are attached. They're not supposed to be attached. They're supposed to be separate. So in this case, you have what we call a twin-twin transfusion. When one fetus becomes the recipient and one fetus becomes the, the donor, Usually this is very dramatic and, and tragic, and usually they both don't do well. They both usually die. If you catch it early enough, you can go in with a laser. Not too much unlike what this is, honestly. You can go through, through the uh, belly and then actually zap these, if you can see them, if they're on the surface. If they're deep, you can't zap them. But, but this is what technologically we're doing in, in today's day and age. So, so now you have this twin-twin transfusion. And just to show you a little bit more of an example of twin-twin transfusion, here you have a fetus that on one side is red, on one side it's white. These are identical twins. A little bit more dramatic, these are identical twins. You have one big, red, hairy one, and one that needs a lot of help because of twin-twin transfusion. So there's a, there's a, 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 a mandiumer, so to speak, that holds that, that indeed, <laughs> this one is the, you know, the ace of ish, Maybe, although these are both girls, and this would be the, the Yako. But it, it's rather dramatic, and it, and it hits that point cl close to home. But wouldn't they eventually, wouldn't they uh, grow up, uh, come with, with, with the low, the lighter one, uh, eventually catch up in weight, and they, they would look more identical? Uh, it, Whereas time goes on, they would, I mean, they're they are basically, they're basically identical. So you're saying if they give them all the same thing, will they catch up? Right, will they catch up? Not, not if they're so severe like that. Mm. Not if they're so severe. Like that one I showed you on the other. The color here was got to be the same. Woody. Let's yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I, so, Robbie, you're asking a very good question, and I don't have the answer to that, but um, so you're saying because he was a redhead and he right. wasn't? Right. Yeah. Okay, so now um, 
let's let's uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, some other uh, some other uh, genetic issues that have come up um, in the books that are, are in the back of, back of the room. Um, Okay, so yeah, so when uh, when I was when I went over this with my wife, she wanted me to talk about the sheep, uh, and talked about the. There's actually a uh, there is a um, a journal article discussing uh, Jacob's flock. It's called. I didn't have time to to pull it, but it talks about um, at the time of conception, you can get what's called maternal imprinting. If you put something in front of, or you have an image in the, in the mother at the time of conception, uh, it's possible to alter the fetus. Not to say that you know if you see if a woman's black and she sees somebody white that she's going to have a white child or, or, or thereabouts. But in this particular where the, the genes are susceptible to this, um, it's possible. Okay, so the Gemara Nivamis um, makes a statement, and we'll pick it up. Right here, Netanya. Mali Rishon, if you circumcise the first child and the first child dies because of the result of the circumcision, Shani, you, you circumcise the second child and the second child dies as a result of the, of the uh, circumcision, Shlishi Lo Timo. Divir Rav Shimon, Rav Shimon Gamliel. Rav Shimon Gamliel Omer. Divir Rav Shimon Gamliel Omer, Shlishi Timo, Rav Lo Timo. What is this uh, saying? If you circumcise one child, and that child dies, and usually it's a bleeding disorder that they die from, where you circumcise the second, and then the second one dies from a bleeding disorder. You don't have to do the maklokas, whether you can go to the third, uh, or, uh, or you can stop right there. Does anyone have a guess what this, uh, what this disease is? Okay. Hemophilia. Okay? Excellent. So this is the first indication, and actually Rabbi Rosner's father, uh, Dr. Fred uh, Rosner, wrote an article um, in the Journal of Hereditary Medicine about the Talmudic reference to hemophilia. Um, so just to discuss, and then Gemara goes on to discuss other genetic diseases, like uh, there's one genetic disease about um, epilepsy, not necessarily genetic, but the Gemara was referring to it, whether or not there are genetic diseases and, and how do you constitute a genetic disease, how many cousins, how many mothers and sisters, and 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 uh, and actually, was, it was touching on uh, X-linked or, or autosomal recessive and whatnot. So it was. Uh, it's an interesting uh, discussion there. Okay. Yeah. Could that also be, uh, let's say, uh, a low immune system that they that they were having? So there's a thing called SCID, um, Skid syndrome. You know, the right. boy in the bubble. Right. Right. So. But they didn't. They don't necessarily would have gotten infection at the same time and died at the, the same first time. Because they, they had that low immune. It may not have been hemophiliac, but it might have been low. low but that's immune. also right. It also could be hereditary. Ah, so it could be hereditary. So he, this is a this is a hemophilia uh, pedigree. Um, you guys may remember this from high school uh, bio. Um, an X-linked recessive carrier. So the mother has an XX. Father is XY. Okay, all of us here are XY, or maybe an extra Y, but that's okay. Um, and this gentleman here is not affected, and she's a carrier. When they have children, there's a 25% chance that the affected gene will be passed on. If it's X, he's only getting one X, and he's getting one Y. He gets one X from his mother, and the Y from the father. Okay? So he gets one X, he's a 50-50 chance to have that affected gene. So if I asked you a question on a test, and I'm sure you guys had this in bio, and you took your, uh, um, you guys live in New York, the Regents, right? And you took your SATs also? So this stuff was on that, right? Yeah. So 50-50 chance of a son being affected or unaffected. And that's all there was. There wasn't any carriers for, for women, uh, for, for men. But for the boys, uh, for the girls, there could be a carrier. Why? Because the X here is going to be unaffected, and there's a 50-50 chance that she could be past each one. So, so that's, that's the heredity of, um, of uh, hemophilia. And this is the gene that you don't have to know. 
So this all came about in the 1850s, uh, 1800s, when Gregor Mendel, uh, he was a Fran Franciscan um, monk or a friar, Augustan friar. Uh, he published a paper. He worked on um, snap peas and little in, in the garden. And it, it turns out that his, a lot of his data was like falsified. Um, it's only been talked about now, but he's like basically the father of modern genetics. Uh, and all these Punnett squares, if you guys remember the Punnett squares, this is a classic carrier, non-carrier, passes it down. You guys nodding your heads like you remember. So about this, but he didn't find any notoriety until decades after his paper was published. But the idea of genes getting passed down to the next generation and in families came on to the, uh, in, into the forefront, so to speak. Um, and, and in 1800 and 1881, uh, Warren Tay was an ophthalmologist and he noted in certain families that he would look into the eyes of these kids and there was this, what we call a cherry red spot and he said that there was this, and that's what they called it. And these kids, whoever had the cherry red spot, would die within four to five years of birth. They would be fine, normal looking kids, perfect kids, and then, and then all of a sudden they would regress. And that he published in 1881. A gentleman by the name of Bernard Sachs noted on these same clusters of patients, published in 1887, he showed that they would, be, that they, that they would develop normally, and then four to five years after development they would regress, and then shortly thereafter they would all, they would all die. And trick question, what's the name of this disease? tay -Sachs. sachs So they named this disease after these, these two uh, uh, researchers, one neurologist and one ophthalmologist, and it was named tay sachs Why is that important for us? Because we're Jewish prone to it. We're prone to it. Um, and it's, we call it a Jewish genetic disease. It's not only a Jewish genetic disease. They see it often in, in uh, Cajun Americans, but it's very important to us because we tend to intermarry within our own kind, so to speak. Um, and this is the, is the, uh, it's an autosomal recessive, so you can have a normal and an affected and then others are carriers, and it has, doesn't have to do, and you can see uh, a girl can have it as well. This is the, uh, the prevalence of the gene, and you can see an Ashkenazic Jewish is 1 in 27, here is French Canadians, 1 in 30, <coughs> Cajun Southern is 1 in 30, so then why? Why isn't there a Dory Sharm for, for Cajuns? Because they, they don't have the restriction for Jews to marry Jews like we do. Um, and they, the Cajuns can marry anyone they want. But here you see that there's a significant 1 in 27. So about the same time as they developed this in the 50s and 60s, they developed a test to test for this. And tay sachs is caused by one small enzymatic deficiency called hexaminodase A deficiency. And it's the first blood test, first disease that can be detected by a blood test. Now we're starting to see, we're going to get into some real issues of um, the, what we get to what we call the Jewish medical ethics. So let's say, um, let's say You did it. So we just mentioned Dory Sharm. And have all you guys been tested for Dory Sharm? Too young. No. Too young? And they I probably won't. It's not the... It's usually more for the shit of seeing the Dory Sharm guys because these guys will probably date and then it's not as applicable. It's not a... You know, it's more in the... Well, so some, some people will. will, some people won't. Right. But I'll spend a minute and a half on it. Um, based on this... In 1969, a rabbi by the name of Rabbi Eckstein, I don't remember his first name, had four children, all died of tay -Sachs. And this was the same time that the blood test was discovered. And, um, and it's, it's fairly devastating to, to, to conceive, have a baby, and then have the baby die um, within four years of life. And it's really dramatic and it's not a fun you know, position to be in. The test comes out and he says, why can't we test these people and see who's a carrier? Who's a carrier and who's not a carrier? And if they're not a carrier, they can 
you know, it doesn't matter who they marry. But if they are a carrier, they shouldn't marry another carrier. And if we could know that before they start dating, it would be great. So he developed this algorithm. He developed a project. Would, you know, I guess nowadays it would be an app um, to to uh, to determine who has the gene. And it's prevalent in the society that that, that Rabbi Eckstein was in. So they asked Rav Moshe, and um, I'll read you what he wrote because it's. It's this new genetic, um, this new genetic, uh, you know, wonders that we're able to, to to figure these things out, and not and not have to. Um, one second, and not have to worry about it, right? And and all of a sudden, in these genes, this whole new science is coming out. And, and nothing's changed for, for 2,000 years, and all of a sudden, we're, we're starting to make, open up the Pandora's box, from Gregor Mendel to Bernard T, uh, to, to the Tay-Sachs, and to the, um, uh, to the whole world that we're gonna be in, in DNA and whatnot. So, so they asked Rav Moshe, we have this, this new thing, this Dory Sharm, um, what can we do with it? So he writes, it is advisable for one preparing to be married to have himself tested. It is also proper to advertise that such a test be available, that is, it is available. It is clear that absolute secrecy must be maintained to prevent anyone from learning the results of such a test performed on another. So the, the, the test was out there. Dori Sharma and Rav Moshe gave his, his stamp of approval. And the incidence of tay up until 1970, the Ashkenazic Jewish population, was was pretty significant. You'd so, you saw about 50 to 100 births a year within the certain uh, within our population. After Dory Sherm started, zero. Nowadays, zero. Although you can see some sporadic cases, and I just learned. Um, do you remember in Mumbai the the uh, the family? Yeah. So they they had pay sex. Rabbi Ginsburg's brother had but it wasn't the genetic it was a uh, it, it was, was a, some other kind of so you can still see he had, so he's his but it's had more it. it's more common to hear about these 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 outlying cases than to hear about it i had a a, a friend of ours from, from muncie this may not know them but also had it and so 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 now you're in a situation where you didn't do dory charm and god forbid something like that happens what can you do so now you have two carriers that are married so in the 70s and the 80s, um, there was something called amniocentesis, where you had an amniotic sac, and here's an actual picture of an amniotic sac um, of a very early fetus. And this is an ultrasound picture. So you would do the uh, amniocentesis, which is basically a needle through the uh, abdomen, okay? And you take out amniotic fluid, and that has cells of the fetus. And you would test them, and you could test to, set to see exactly what that is. So they could tell if the baby had down, they could tell if the baby had Tay-Sachs, and now what they would do with it. They brought that question to Rev Moshe. And, uh, and Rev Moshe Paskind, he said, it's us, usur to perform a termination, because that's a, a living fetus. You can't perform a termination. And I'm just gonna give you, I'm not gonna Paskin for anyone here, I'm going to give you the, the, the left side and the right side. Um, it's, it's forbidden to perform a termination on this fetus, and because an amniocentesis carries risk to the fetus, because it can cause an infection and it can cause a miscarriage, you can't even do the amniocentesis. So that was Reb Moshe, and Reb Moshe was all the way, I don't know if you say left or right. There was another, the, the three big uh, post of the last, 50 years in, in medical ethics was Rav Moshe, uh, Rav Wallenberg, the Tzitz Eliezer, and Shlomo Zaman Orbach. Unfortunately, we've lost all three in the last you know, few decades, but Rav, Rav Wallenberg, the Tzitz Eliezer, poskined that you can do an amniocentesis, you can find out if the fetus is affected, and you can terminate up until the seventh month of, pre seventh month of pregnancy. And they've had some heated uh, discussions back and forth based on that. But this is not a discussion about um, abortion, nor do I want to 
I kind of gave the left and the right and everything in between. I uh, did you know? I have it. I have it written. I didn't. I just was kind of giving examples. But how do we know that that uh, uh, yeah? Um, are you allowed to do everything you could to uh, like like there are ways to like not like like in a non-direct way to try to end like are you allowed to like like it's like do everything it says like don't do while you're pregnant to try to end the. Uh, Smoke cigarettes and. No, that probably is not advisable because then you, then you probably won't cause a mis miscarriage. You're talking about like causing a miscarriage, right? right? So it's it's probably not advisable because you probably do more harm to yourself, um, right? Um, so there is a mishnayic uh, source to to, call, to to doing terminations, which is an abortion. Um, in in Olos, uh, Eric Zion, uh, Mishnah Bav. Ha'isha shehi makashta leleid, a woman who's pregnant and is in labor and is having a very difficult labor, and she, it's clear, this woman is going to die if she continues with this labor. Machat fetus of lad, you actually can cut up the fetus inside of her. You can take it out piece by piece. Because her life comes before its life. Because she's alive and this fetus isn't. But if it came out a little bit and its head, most of the saying its head came out, you can't. Because then it has a life and then, then they're kind of equal. But here is a, here is a, a, a Mishnah that we learn, you know, all the time, no, maybe not all the time, but that clearly has a, a source for abortion. It's a, yeah. It's not really relevant to Taysan's case though, right? No, but, but it's, it's, it, it's not, actually there's some, there's some <coughs> contemporary halakhic authorities that <coughs> will hold psychiatric illness is kamat, uh, uh, is like this. So if someone would say, this woman would go crazy if she had a Tay-Sachs baby, another one or something like that. And that's the, I have the sources for it. They would say like, you know, someone who can't, you know, I can't handle such and such. Then, then that, that would be halakhically mutter. I, I'm not a rabbi, I don't paskin. No, 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 okay, no. but there are, but what I'm giving you is, is somewhat of a source that is halakhically acceptable, that is out there. Yeah. What is the, uh, are you familiar with what, what does the uh, non like shit up dating world do as far as Tezax? Because how would the number be zero if they don't do the third term? So you can get, there, there's, so good question. In my practice, if faced with a person who didn't go to Dory Sharm, there's what we call an Ashkenazic Jewish panel. Because it's not just Tezax anymore. There's like eight different Ashkenazic Jewish diseases. Fanconi's. Fanconi's anemia. Anyone else? Familial dysautonomia. Neiman Pick, Tay Sachs, Cystic Fibrosis. Right, CF. Um, What's a K? Uh, Canavan. Canavan's disease, and as well, Riley Day is familiar with dysautonomia. But you get the you get that one, and you can test them, and you can test the woman if they're. So now you're saying if they're the one out of twenty-seven, and some of them are a little bit higher. If they're that one out of thirty, one out of forty for the other diseases. Then you test the husband. So you, so you really get into a very, or even to the boyfriend or the, to the fiance. Right. So you're, so you're, you're knocking <laughs> it down. If they're positive, then you may have to do the amnio. But nowadays, this is what's leading me to this one. And again, my comment is, we are in a era of the science is, is, and the technology is far outpacing what contemporary medical ethics is about, and, and not Jewish medical ethics, because that also predates everything but it's getting hard to keep up. So, this is something called PGD. Does anyone know what PGD is? Keto and White's was here. Oh, he was? Yeah. And he gave, a, he gave this already? He spoke about PGD. Yeah, not, not, all, not everything you're covering, but he spoke about PGD. Okay, so PGD is pre- So does anyone remember? What, <laughs> <laughs> Where they, uh, they take out all the bad um, genes and or leave the ones that take out the ones that will cause the disease. No, not not necessarily. That's probably he probably spoke about that, but that's not this. PGD is basically you take you can 
pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. In vitro fertilization is when patients are infertile, you take the woman's seed and the male seed, you put it together in a little dish and you grow embryos, right? And you take those embryos and they grow and you put back the ones that grow nicely and you discard the ones that don't grow nicely, which is another halakhic shayla that you have to deal with. But now you have this patient who has uh, the, a bad gene and the, hus and the husband also has a bad gene. So you take her seed and his seed and you grow embryos. Um, and this is it. You basically take it to a stage of eight cells and you, well it used to be eight, now it's more. And you take off one cell and you test those cells to see if that embryo that's growing has that genetic disease. If it does, you discard it. If it doesn't, you can uh, implant it. So you only implant the good, the good embryos. So this gets into a whole discussion about, well, if you have a bunch of good embryos, what do you do with those, old, with, with those embryos that you're not implanting? Um, and that's also a halakhic chayla. What are they considered? So if you are George Bush and you are a, uh, you know, a staunch uh, Christian or you, you believe the, the Roman Catholic Church holds that embryos are, are live fetuses and they, and they can't be discarded. So you can't do stem cell research according to the strict letter of the law. Um, and there's a lot of embryo uh, technology that's being developed and being studied um, that wouldn't be studied if you went by the strict letter of the Catholic law. But the Jewish law states that these embryos, the, the, they can be worked on. Again, you'd have to ask your local rabbinic authority. I just want to get, I know I have this question discussed many times. We're dealing with uh, cells that are on the size of the microbes. Yes. Right so, so this picture, this picture is under, you're not doing this in a petri dish, you're doing it under a microscope. But by naked eye, it's not physical. No, you can't see it. So and I mean, I don't mean, not the lachal, we don't deal with anything that the eye can't see. But, it, but so it, you could swallow the microbes. Right, the the, the, of the bugs, the whole bug shy of We've so many times, if you can't see it. Uh, that it doesn't the, exist, right? It doesn't right. exist. And I, said, I, don't, I really don't know why people refer that to question in halacha. I mean, I, about, I mean, about embryos? About embryos. Yeah, but anything mm -hmm. that can't be seen by the eye, according to Ramosha, just it doesn't exist. Otherwise, you can't swallow any saliva. So that's uh, <laughs> these are good. I mean, you're asking a good right, question. So, I mean, so, I, yeah. mean, I know people always say it's a big shyla, and I always say back to them, I don't see what the shyla is. Right, because they period just don't have. Uh, they, they, uh, I'll be yeah. they don't exist. Well, that was the whole. Uh, why did they, the it, church? The, the church is it, influencing everybody. Yeah. But not the Torah. Way. I, uh, I I happen to agree. I mean, I know it, it also and Rabbi Tenler also felt good. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> if it does, if you can't see, what the rabbi's saying is that if you can't see something with the naked eye. It shouldn't be considered. It's not considered anything. Um, so, so that's where we, we came at. All right. Well, what what would be then in that case? If you had a you had a woman who's uh, who's one week pregnant or something like that. Really, you did a pregnancy test. You could tell she's pregnant because of her hormones. But it was a sacmy almond, just a bigger a bigger fluid. Yeah. So the so best time to do it. So they chose. If the woman chose, oh. Now I don't want to like the morning after pill type of thing. Ah. That that, that was a good question. Well, but it's not it's not really anything according to that. that. That's true. It's not it's not really it's not really anything. Um, uh, what just can I make a statement? Morning after pill. There's two types. There's one that's within 72 hours. That is not an abortifacient. That does not cause a miscarriage. That impedes conception. The morning after pill called L01 which is not available in Israel, but is available in the States, is a five day after. That can cause, actually that doesn't cause it. You're talking about the RU486. That's the abortion yeah, pill. Yeah. Concept. Okay. Concept. Okay. All right. I just want to make sure, I don't want to go on tape here that I said the morning after pill is an abortifacient because my company sells that and it does not cause an abortion. <laughs> okay, so just to be clear. So you're talking about RU48 that disrupts the pregnancy. Yeah, I'm saying I'm saying based on the philosophy of saying right. 
that something that that's a bag of cells. Right, so if at that point, if I was saying, at that point they know yeah. something wrong with the child, just kind of this is absolutely no problem. Yeah, but what if but they, just got, to, they just don't want the kid? Right. So that's a, you have we hold yeah. life begins from from the sperm. You can't yeah. even waste sperm. Right, right. So you're running into that problem. Uh, the cell is a right. problem. Uh, this is it's certainly going to be a problem. It, you you know, can't do it. Phase of problem. Right. You can't do it. The, re the, the different reasons why you can't do it. So take this PGD for example. What if, and this, this has come up and there's Chuva's written about it. What if it's a Kohen who, who can't conceive and needed, needed to get the male seed, the, the, the sperm from outside, do IVF with his wife and then implant that. Can he, and they say that you're supposed to take the uh, non-Jewish sperm to donate. Rabbi Weissman may have spoken about it. Moshe, because are sleeping. you allowed to do PGD on that to make sure it's a, a girl, a female, so that it won't be a Cohen when he goes up and dokens his, you know, the son who was born from his wife, right? It, it's going to be all these talking, right? So can you make it a girl? Because you can. You can do sex selection. It's 100% sex selection? Yeah. Really? With PGD. I mean, there's a trans, the translocate, whatever. It's like, the, the, the chance of it not being 100% is, is, is remote. Have people but, done it? What? Have people done that? Yeah, people do. I had, uh, whatever. I had, a, I had an attending in, in, in a residency who didn't do PGD, just did an ultrasound, and, and would abort the fetus if it wasn't a girl. So they do sex selections even without this, but the, the sex selection is a big question. But they could also do the eye color and that kind of thing? Yeah, but they're not doing it. They, they, that's more or less, uh, this is the knowledge and this is what we do now, but the ethicists start asking those questions. Uh -huh. And where do you draw the line? Right, so you have to have, if you have a basis of halacha, then you, at least you can say there's no question. You don't, because in today's world, we're always pushing the line. In, in modern day, in contemporary, in non-Judaic medical ethics. And I think that that was what, and there was a couple comments here I wanted to talk about, I think I'm way over time, but All right. but the, the, the whole idea of Jewish medical ethics is that we base all our, uh, on, on, on our sources, and then we kind of not adapt to today's, what's going into those sources, but we take the sources and they, those are, you can't bend. Whereas today, in, in the contemporary ethics, they are very, you know, wishy-washy, depends on who you're, you know, what church you go to, what this guy says, and what that's the Pope says, and everything can adapt to what the people want, because you get elected, and then you make the laws. And I'll, we'll talk about that in a second, about stem cell research, on how if it's a Democratic president, you're going to put billions into stem cell research. But if it's a Republican president, they're, they're going to cut all stem cell research. And that happened when Bush was president. So it, this, is not, this is not far away. Um, there was a question and a comment. PGD, ah, so let's, let's take a, and, and again, I was tr not tasked, but I was asked to talk about what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and so I wanted to give you some examples of, um, well, let me finish what I prepared, because I don't even think we, we didn't even get up to the, the <laughs> to, to the contemporary medical ethics. We went from law with um, Hammurabi's code to medical ethics with uh, Hippocrates to the Rambam to modern day genetics. But like I was saying, medical ethics is not based on, but has four basic tenets: uh, autonomy, beneficence, non-malfeasance, and justice. Patients are autonomous people. You can't force them to do anything, although in Jewish medical halakha, you, you can. Um, beneficence is, I should always be thinking of the best interest of the patient. Non-malfeasance is, I should first do no harm. And justice is a, a, a more debatable one, and that one's the one that bends a lot in, in contemporary medical ethics. Um, and that's about the distribution of scarce health resources. And often these four go head to head with each other. And many issues can come up where the, you have to take one over the other. And it's not so black and white. For example, if there's one heart available on the transplant list is a 70-year-old girl, a 40-year-old principal, or a 70-year-old woman. 
So, by show of hands, who, who would choose the 17 year old girl? According to American Medicine? Yeah, this, the last two slides were the, according to American, American. Who would choose the 40 year old school principal? Who would choose a 70 year old woman? Now, what if I was to tell you that the 70, 17 year old girl has heart disease because she injected IV drugs and she's a drug abuser and gave herself um, a infection that destroyed her heart? And the 40 year old never picked up a ball in his life and his cholesterol is 300 and he gave himself heart disease because he smoked six packs a day. And the 70 year old woman, you know, is the healthiest one that she could live on many of Ashtonshana. So all of a sudden, it changes the entire complexity. There's no answer to these questions, by, by the way. But these um, are the four you know, tenets of basic medical bioethics, not the Jewish bioethics. And we just talk about that. Jewish bioethics, Jewish medical ethics, was really created by um, uh, Lord Emanuel, Sir Lord Emanuel, Rabbi uh, uh, Jacobowitz um, in in the 50s and 60s, he wrote a, his PhD paper was Jewish medical ethics. Um, and he goes through all the different uh, thinking on how we develop answers and how the Rabbanim come to, uh, to Chuvo on uh, based on the, like I said, the text that you have in the back of the, um, uh, in the back of the, of the room. Um, and, and he ends, the challenges of a technological age. And we, we uh, tend to really care about, I have one quote in here, one second, from him. Right, so secular medical ethics is the effort to turn ethical guidelines or rules of conscience into law, into legislation, that you can or cannot do anything anymore. For example, one state in the U.S., you can do a, an abortion up to 24 weeks, one you can't do it up until 12 weeks, and one, you know, and some are outlawing it at all. So they go across state lines to do it. So once it becomes legislature, and, and, and then it becomes legislative law adopted by different legislatures. Jewish medical ethics does the reverse. We determine law or legislation, distill it, and then come to the conclusion that it includes certain ethical guidelines. Thus, and this is the take-home message, Jewish medical ethics derives from legislation, from the Tanakh, from Torah, from, from the way that, that it was given down in Har Sinai. It does not lead to legislation. Because anyone in government can then just change the legislation. And that's not the way it works uh, by us. And that's it in a nutshell. And there's a couple of interesting quotes here. Um, Uh, he talks about uh, very in important because when technology advanced and we were able to do uh, heart transplants, um, is a heart transplant halakhically mutter? So everyone takes it for granted that it is, but how do you know that if you take a heart out of somebody, you're actually killing them, right? So, and also there's a prohibition of nivel amais. Person dies, what if the person's brain dead, but they're still technically alive because they're on a respirator and the heart is beating? So that's a very difficult decision to make. Um, so he writes, the prohibition of nivola mate, which is actually de defiling a dead body. So you're able to, the person dies, and you're able to do a heart transplant, take the heart, harvest the heart immediately, and get it into ice, and for the transplant. So, but then you're just desecrating a dead body. That's nivola mate. So nivola mate would then be suspended by the overriding consideration of the kuach nefesh, saving another, uh, um, Save another body because that's that's paramount and that's the top saving someone's life. But aren't, aren't hearts more complicated because the person's still meaning, uh, the heart's beating, right? Yeah, yeah it's, still, it's still the guy would be still alive, right? But so there's a timing that you could turn the respirator off, allow the person to expire, and within this and, and have it right there and ready, and then take it out. Uh -huh. I'm not again getting into the yeah. specifics, and I don't know if you've ever had any of those shilas. <laughs> yeah, you try to bump up those shilas. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so you may or may not be aware. Does anyone know who the person in the bottom right is? Okay, 
So why did she get into the news recently? She got a uh, mastectomy. Yeah. She had a double mastectomy. Yeah. Oh, okay. she had breast cancer. She didn't have breast yeah. cancer. Yeah. It's um, high risk. High risk. She had the gene that causes breast cancer. Unfortunately, it's also an Ashkenazic Jewish gene. We get everything. And does anyone know why we get these things? I mentioned we, it earlier. Because we can breathe. We, we stayed within it. When we got kicked out of Spain, we all went there. When we got kicked out of there, we all went there. We all kind of, it's called the founder's effect. We kind of stayed amongst each other. Mutations do happen in his DNA, and we just kept it to ourselves. We didn't share. So I pulled an article that was in the New York Times that was written November 26, 2013. That's like two weeks ago, three weeks ago, less than a month ago. And it talks about this breast cancer gene. This chromosome this BRCA1, we call it, BRCA1 and 2, where these patients, you know, and, and again, Shmuel asked me to talk about what I deal with on an everyday basis as a physician. Every day I talk to a patient, I ask them, do you have any medical problems? Do you have any surgeries? Do you have any allergies? Do you want any medications? Are there any, thing, are there any medical problems in your family? Well, my, my sister was just diagnosed with breast cancer. My aunt died of breast cancer. And all of a sudden, you start thinking to yourself, oh, you know, I have to do a, a, a cancer model risk on her. I have to see if she has this gene. We have, to have, we have to talk the talk. It's a massive talk. It destroys my entire day in the office because it's a, it's a long talk because there's really dramatic implications. If you do a bilateral mastectomy and take out her ovaries as well, you, you can save her life. It's a 50-50 chance that she's going to get breast cancer or ovarian cancer. And if you take it out, then you, you've given her uh, an 85% of, uh, of survival. So these are the things that I do on a daily basis. And these are the things that you have to look. And again, when I talk to the patients, you look at, at, um, at cancer clusters, we call them, within families. And it's the classic pedigree of, you know, when you talk to the patient, they won't, you know, breast, ovary, prostate, uh, pancreatic. Men can get breast cancer as well, so they're not out of the woods. Um, here's the article from November 26th, the New York Times in Israel. In, in, in fact, um, I know some of the people that were in this article. We had breakfast with them last Friday. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, you know, God bless them, all right, because they're out there. And there's actually, if you, if you click on the link, uh, the New York Times article, uh, there's a video. Um, and, so the, and so as a physician, these are the things, these are the questions I get. We talked about prenatal diagnosis. This is from December 2013. So now, remember we talked about PGD, pre-implantation pre genetic diagnosis? We talked about amniocentesis. Now, in the last year, they've discovered that they can take a maternal blood sample. They could take blood from the mother when a woman is pregnant as early as six weeks. And you had asked how early is to be considered termination, right? When it's okay. And they talk about 45 days or 49 days. Right. So as early as six weeks, they can find the needle in the haystack. They can find a fetal blood cell. It's actually fetal DNA. And, and they can test it and see if it has genetic problems. Think about that. They told us, uh, we, we, uh, I just had a baby not okay. that long ago, a few months ago, and they, they told us that, the, uh, that the, they could do the test, but the, those blood tests are not, they're not conclusive. Nothing in life is 100%. No, but they said... Even an amniocentesis can... It's much less than an amniocentesis, I mean much... Uh, Right. Yeah. It's, it's close to 97, 98, 99 percent. Oh, really? When you're talking about, and there's other blood tests that, that, that I talk to patients, again, what I do every day, I talk to patients and they don't want to get these tests because then it leads down the path of an amnio and then a termination. And, it, and I always say, if you're not going to do the end result, then don't do the middle one, don't do the first one. Okay? But, um, but this, this has no risk. And, and I'm not sure if there's been any discussion amongst, amongst the halakhic authorities on these tests. I think it, it's a similar um, opinion to say, if you're not going to terminate, then why do the test? But if someone is, like we learned in the Gemara earlier, what if it's happened once or it happened twice? 
Do you have to do it again? What, what, do, you, what do you have to go to? Because IVF is a problem. Because you can do shift Zera. That's You don't want to have to throw away those embryos. Maybe this is enough. But if this is enough and you get it positive, then you might have to do a termination. So I touched on a lot today. I touched on the history of law, history of ethics. I touched on regular medical ethics. I touched on Jewish medical ethics. I hope that I gave you a little taste about what I do on a day-to-day -day basis on how I try to tie in everything. Obviously, I always tell my patients I'm not a halakhic authority, but, and then we go into, into, you know, these are what I've heard of different opinions, but they all need to find their rabbinic source. I, you know, I can count on one hand how many times I said those things to my patients in, in Long Island, but here it's every single day I'm in the office. Um, and, it's, and it's exciting, it's real, it makes it fun. Um, and, uh, and I'm open for questions if anyone wants to discuss what I talked about here. Or this type of test, so they actually pick out the baby's blood cells from the mothers. Yeah, wow, it's unbelievable. It's a it's a proverbial needle in a haystack. When I was in residency, a woman by the name of Sue Gross was working on this, and um, I don't know if she has any papers written on this, but she, but she was a uh, she's at Einstein. No, she wasn't here. But but uh, but there is uh, it's unbelievable. How um, how the and, and now they're only doing the big three of trisomy 21, 18, and 13, but they're just right around the corner because all they need to do is take that one cell. One, it's not even the fragment. It's called cell-free <coughs> DNA, and um, and they're able to know it, it, that, How do you know it's not the mother's DNA? Right. right? They, they they say without a doubt it's not the mother's DNA. And the mother, and how do you know it's not a prior pregnancy? Right? That's another question. How do you know she doesn't have something or a miscarriage two, two months ago? Because they know. They, they, they said that they tested and they said that it's cleaned out within, uh, within a month after delivery. Yeah. Unbelievable. You don't share your blood type with your mother, so what is... What Why not? not? Don't you not always share your blood type? You can. Type? You can, but I mean, what from the baby is in the mother's bloodstream? Little fragments of the of fetal DNA. DNA. Yeah, little fragments of DNA. And with that, they can figure out like any kind of issue with the baby. Yeah. Well, right now it's it's a little bit it's early, but they're not too far from doing a full genetic mapping, like we saw before on the PGD slide. A full genetic mapping of. Uh, uh, with that, okay, which is incredible. Okay, and that when I know, so they're, they're, they're finding the, how long when they when, 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 so, when so as early as six weeks after conception, and the, the recommended time now is about nine to about ten to eleven weeks because that's when they uh, okay. So, but I'll, to your to your point, it's at six weeks. Um, it's less reliable. Because you'll probably just get a false test, which won't get any DNA, because there's just not a lot of it, because it's so small. Just a yeah, follow-up question? Yeah, okay. Um, Sorry, one second. So, we said before that things that are not seen by the naked eye it do not really fall under any kind of a logic. Right. Says. This, however, according to people at least who don't really fall all that way, apparently, are having things, making some kind of a of disputes about it. Do the, is this affect anything? Like I don't know the whole lot that's behind abortions and miscarriages and kind. Of, is there like a time period? Yes. Like, like, yes. Time period. Uh, it, the best is uh, never great, but the best is forty nine days from conception. Oh, okay. So this is past that already. Borderline. Yeah, it's it's on the borderline. No, board, no, it's not that, actually. So does this like because like there's DNA of the baby running around? Does that change anything or? No. No. Right. It doesn't. Um, I know there was a, a, a physician who specialized in something called chorionic villi sampling, where they would do early, early um, sampling of, of the placenta. Actually, I could show you because I, I, this is a, this pregnancy, this is like, I'm going to say uh, seven to eight weeks. Okay? You can see they just have limb buds. Probably nine, not nine weeks, and and so they would go in and tap this right here with a needle, 
-hmm. and take off tissue. And it's called a chorionic villi sampling. You do that very, very early. <laughs> so this physician called Mark, his name is Mark Evans. He said he, he was in, um, he was in Chicago and he moved to New York. When he moved to New York, they, they, would, they would fly to Chicago because he was a specialist in this, the, like the world leader and the expert in it. He would have Orthodox women coming to him out the door because the halachic permissibility um, was easier earlier to do a termination if they had a genetic. It's one of these genetic things we talked about. They had a prior kid with it or they, they knew that they had a, a genetic disease that they would you know, potentially pass on that's lethal. So the earlier you do it, the less problematic it is. One, uh, he had a question first, was, sorry. Um, so the, the conception uh, thing that like stops conception, is that allowed? <laughs> so the, okay, so you're asking a contraception question. Yeah. Okay, you're asking. But so you said your company sells those pills. Right. So what's. So is it, are you allowed, is, is an Orthodox person allowed to take them? So every, every contraception question, it doesn't, it doesn't differ from the type of contraception you take. Meaning that the first question is, can this couple take contraception? And that is individualized to the person. And I could go through some of the sources that it's not yes or no. It's we have to find out about this couple, what they are, where they're at in life, and then individualize so the answer that. to that person. So they take that into effect? Like yeah, so if, so if the answer is yes, and they happen to have been off the contraception, the approved contraception for that month, and they had unprotected intercourse, and then they're to have uh, the morning after pill, right. so then that would be the same as taking a birth control pill every day. Because it doesn't interfere with conception. I mean, uh, it doesn't interfere with uh, the fetus, it interferes with, with the conception as the same mechanism as, uh, as birth control pills, S similar mechanism. I don't want to err into sides of uh, um, halakhic, uh, on clarity. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned you, you started a biotech company. What does that do? Well, it was a medical device company for, um, for fibroids, women's fibroids. Okay. Develop their benign growth in the uterus. It's closed. It started about five years ago. You had a question? Yeah. Um, what have you heard uh, when you have patients who are thinking about vasectomy or uh, along those lines? Vasectomy or mastectomy? Mas oh, okay. Um, women with yeah, breast yeah, women, cancer. Yeah. So what, what have you heard as far as like the halachic uh, disputes, or are there any about doing a surgery, a preventative surgery like that? So, preventative medicine is a halachic discussion all in itself, and, and I can, again, I have, I don't know if I have an hour and a half on uh, preventative medicine, but, but it, there's different man yomer, there's different um, shito about, uh, about what length you can go to preventative medicine. Um, I don't know if you have any comments on that. Uh, the, to make a long story short, the patients that I've referred to, to get the surgery have gotten, you know, multiple opinions that have all recommended it. Because it's not, a, it's, it's, a, it's a, a clear benefit and it clearly shows lengthening life. So the, the benefits outweigh the risks by far. But it could be that, say, you know, patients don't have cancer, they shouldn't do anything yet. Do you have any? I, I mean, basically, I think it's going very nicely, but especially dealing with some, something that can be a suffix for course, not fish. Yeah. It would outweigh uh, anything. And, uh, and, and uh, for example, Moshe said, even let's say the birth control pill, uh, he said it doesn't involve Shifa Zelovatala because it just makes her as if she's pregnant and there's nothing. And so, so Bia is taking place in right. a normal way. But that would be different than other kinds of things. Yeah, okay, so everything has to be judged by. Right. Know, Everything's got to be individualized. There's I just really had one thing, or emotional, yeah. very strongly that a, a psychological uh, event is because of Okay. And he carried that an awful lot in his decisions. 
those are wild questions. But the Tzitz Eliezer uses psychological as his as his, one of his reasons right. to allow abortion. Abortion, right. And he and he and he right. did thought it. That's true. Bar- Bar- it, Moshe also held very strong. It, it, it's a it's a fascinating debate because yeah, he 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 Rav Moshe questions Rav Yaakov Emden, and right the whole Tosfos right. he says that's a misprint. Right. right. He says that that's a misprint that we have in our in our uh, Tosfos right. and Zamar. It can't be. It can't be. Right. Can't be. Right. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that he can. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's uh it's good stuff you know and 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 what's so important is that. It's changing day to day. Things happen at such a rapid pace. I mean, if you go, you know, I'm going to drive home and I'm going to listen to the radio or I'll, I'll look on in a newspaper, and there's going to be some new technological, scientific advance that the rabbi is going to have to deal with. You know, it's really, uh, it's very exciting. and You need to stay on top of that. So thank you for the time. I think any other questions, comments, concerns? Thank you.